Hello, everyone. I'm Ira Steinman, David Garfield over here. We're here to talk about our new book, just published by Karnak, Self-Psychology and Psychosis. The development of the self during the intensive psychotherapy of schizophrenia and the other psychoses. David's going to start in by talking about some of the principles of self-psychology and psychosis. And then the two of us will read a, present a case, the shortest in the book, which gives a very nice indication of how the two of us interact and interplay in the course of this book. This, the idea for this book began at ISPS in Madrid in 2006, when David was a discussant at a symposium that I organized where I presented a number of my cases. And David was such an outstanding discussant, I knew that he was the ideal person to write this book with me. Thank you. That is very, very <laughs> generous. Um, and uh, we also sort of continued that into, um, into, um, into ISPS in Croatia. That's right. That's right. At Dubrovnik. At Dubrovnik. So just to, to give you a little bit of taste, um, also I think Matteo Maziol is going to be talking about self-psychology, I think with a case at 4.30. Um, so there's a little bit of self-psychology at the conference. And um, let's see if I can um, You all have this, so I'm basically going to be reading a little bit of this to you, so you'll get uh, an introduction into um, how we begin to think about self-psychology and psychosis. Uh, nowhere do psychoanalysts and therapists of all persuasions more clearly find distortions of the self than those they encounter who are caught in the throes of psychosis. And as hallucinations, delusions, and thought disorder take hold, patients struggle mightily to regain their footing. And here, a positive coloring of the self, a temporal continuity within the self, and <clears throat> they are, and, and a cohesiveness of the self, which are the self-object functions, are frequently lost or stand in immediate danger of dissolving. Where could we find a better place for an understanding of the essence of self than in uh, these x-rays of shattered minds? Well, throughout the history of uh, psychoanalysis, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of references to and understandings of the self. Um, yet what makes psychoanalytic self-psychology so compelling, and I think the conference is really sort of pointing this out as we go more towards um, experts in, in experience, uh, which is very exciting. Um, but what makes this particular theory, I think, so compelling as a framework for understanding psychosis is it how, how it links together the early recognition of, of uh, narcissistic impairment in these disorders to the experience near, experience near focus, which is the hallmark of self-psychology. Um, so we have time to read the case to you, and you'll hear some of the explication of this particular case. The book is really a case book. So there are seven, eight, nine cases that are discussed from the point of view of self-psychology, and this will be just one of them. Uh, Freud early on had eschewed the wisdom of using psychoanalysis as a vehicle for cure in the narcissistic psychoneuroses. And even Kohut took years before he embraced the idea that analysis could have a beneficial effect um, on psychosis. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here, um, but it, it has to do with Kohut addressing the candidates at the Chicago Institute back in 1975. And um, he brought in the Humpty Dumpty analogy of Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Um, and the whole issue was uh, that Humpty Dumpty couldn't put the pieces back together again. Um, and so Kohut started discussing this. Uh, and uh, 
you know, we'll talk, we'll, we'll get to some of the body-based metaphors that are very experienced near that uh, our patients report and some of us with our concordant countertransferences experience. Um, but what he did note was that uh, he said, a refined understanding of these kinds of experiences is what I think will give us access, empathic access to psychosis. If you really can achieve empathic access to psychosis, psychosis in one sense has ceased to exist. Um, so what does that mean? Earlier in 59, Kohut steered modern psychoanalysis toward a new way of understanding patients in his article, Introspection, Empathy, and Psychoanalysis. And before really free association had reigned supreme as a way of understanding patients, looking at all of their associations. And what Kohut suggested instead was that through vicarious introspection where we go inside and we find some experience somewhere that gives us a little uh, sensory emotional taste of what the patient is describing, that vicarious introspection is the main road to understanding what's going on in depth. Uh, by accessing experience of a similar affective tone, an attunement can be established, affording clinicians entree into a, this more refined understanding. And it's not that free association is thrown out, but rather its role in collecting information about the patient is subordinated to that of empathy. And the last 50 years has seen a blossoming of ideas and methods related to empathic attunement, which we go into much more detail in the book. Well, uh, we'd like you to join us um, in today in session with one such patient or a series of sessions. This is Ira's case. Um, all of the cases in the book are real life experiences. And um, I think I'll just very quickly sort of point out the rest of this introduction. You can read it. Um, you know, we have, I think, a total of 20 copies. Um, and so uh, there are some outside. Uh, but I'll just sort of list through maybe six, seven, eight of the main sort of ideas um, from the article that many of you have or the introduction. It's almost in the forward edge. So self-psychology has evolved where the, to think of a total transference and where there's a trailing edge transference, which is what we usually know where we are caught up in sort of the difficult um, part of experiences that patients have where there have been tremendous hopes or trauma associated with them. And that's a, traditionally what we call repetition. But Marion Tolpin in 2002 outlined the total transference where at the front, um, which were uh, in a developmental arrest, you would have still the patient's sort of tendrils of health that were still alive and looking to sort of grab onto some sunlight or to be nourished by some water. Um, and that was called the forward edge. So there was a forward edge of growth and growth potential that Tolpin sort of outlined in her classic 2002 paper to give us a, a, a total understanding of the total transference. And it's in, um, so one thing has to do, and the, the forward edge consists of basically three of Kohut's self-object experiences, which were mirroring experience, affirming, being recognized, um, uh, then there's um, idealizing experiences where you can feel safe and where you have uh, hope for yourself for the future. Um, and then there's also uh, twinship transferences where you have an alikeness. And these are all that fill in the gaps of very sort of powerful when we're talking about psychosis, narcissistic experiences um, <clears throat> that have been very uh, uh, debilitating. Second idea is, is that instead of looking at defense mechanisms per se, um, when people start to institute these procedures, it really can be viewed as, from a different angle, as fears of being re-traumatized. There's something going on which brings you close to a point where you're very, very worried about being re-traumatized. And that's where uh, we think of defense mechanisms as being um, different. <coughs> 
So fears of re-traumatization. The centrality of affect in the mind and the body is a hallmark of uh, experience, new, experience near self-psychology. Um, in working with patients who are reconstituting. Dan Stern's notion, I think, has made its way into self-psychology in a very powerful way um, in notions about vitality affects, vitality forms, and their intrinsic position at the intersection of body and mind. And there are new, these are good new tools, I think, for the therapeutic toolbox in terms of a quest for reestablishing cohesion. And coherence is the objective. Um, an empathic grasp uh, of the patient lends a hand to keep the patient from falling further into a pit um, or off the cliff. And an in-depth understanding, so there's understanding and there's explaining. Understanding is really what's uh, tantamount to the entire empathic process and how you can get into that. And then explaining helps solidify that framework within the patient as a result of also within the self-object transference. Um, finding one's balance mitigates against the forces of becoming unbalanced. And there's a very physicality of metaphors that we choose in this explication. And the result is a positive affective coloring. Um, opening channels between the past and the present with hopes for the future is the day-to-day -day work of all psychoanalysts, yet self-psychology, one of its primary intentions is to restore a sense of uh, a lost sense of temporal continuity. Yes, we're all changing. Yes, we're not exactly the same as we were before, but there is a continuity. Um, so there is a interesting, and this is back from 1971 in the analysis of the self. There's an interesting chart. It's in the introduction in the book about breakdowns. Um, and the self psychology is really a psychology of the whole self rather than of agencies of the mind. And that symptoms that are traditionally thought of as being conflict really involve empathic disruptions um, at certain developmental stages. So symptoms are a result of empathic disruption and require disruption and repair. Uh, finally, um, I think we will uh, touch on something called the vertical split, which is at the end of the introduction. It's an important component of self-psychology in terms of understanding psychopathology or symptoms. Here the unmodified grandiose self is excluded from the realistic sector of the mind through the use of disavowal. There's been a lot written about this. Another of Kohut's early students and collaborators, Arnold Goldberg, has explored it extensively. And you'll hear about the vertical split when we talk about um, three rats and the extraterrestrial. Well, I always loved presenting with David, and I loved even more writing this book with him because it gives me such a nice slant, such a nice vantage point on what I've been doing all these years. Three Rats and the Extraterrestrial. Lois was a depressed, withdrawn woman in her mid-30s when she consulted me. She had a previous diagnosis of chronic paranoid schizophrenia, had been hospitalized several times and had been treated for the previous seven years with antipsychotics. She lived in a halfway house for the better part of a year and now lived alone in a rooming house. She was unkempt, disheveled, clearly preoccupied and hallucinating. She'd been married but was now divorced. She'd given up custody of her children and had had a persistent delusion for years that three rats were gnawing away at her gnawing away at her heart. She had little contact with anyone except for an old friend of hers who had sent her to me. By everyone's account, she was a burnt out case. The diagnosis of chronic schizophrenia had been made during one of her first hospitalizations when she told a psychiatrist about the three rats gnawing at her. People with delusions are beset by beliefs, images, and a concatenation of feelings that it is impossible for them to bear, at least to bear in their current vulnerable state. Hence the delusion, the projection outside of themselves of issues they can't handle. Like Freud's notion of the return of the repressed, having to do with issues one has put out of consciousness coming back to bedevil one, these people, perhaps due to a greater imaginative quality, 
perhaps a poor synthetic ability, perhaps more pain and trauma in life than most people could bear, end up projecting issues outside of themselves. Self-psychology <laughs> sees delusions from a slightly different vantage. Um, all of the above reflections remain, but what the psychology of the self adds um, is that a delusional system is a compensatory structure that actually serves to prevent fragmentation um, or more fragmentation. So uh, projected issues are like a tethered rubber ball on a paddle. They keep coming back to where they begin. The fearful, isolated, lonely, persecuted patient gets the interest and involvement that one craves, but without an experience and a, and a ex experience of either being mirrored or an experience of, which is an experience of being known, or an experience of, of uh, being uplifted in some way, which is similar to being safe. Um, the anxiety and, or, or having a kindred spirit uh, in a twinship experience, Unfortunately, the anxiety, fears, and times, uh, and, and at times terror, really never abates. Um, so with all the people who are after you, it doesn't really give you much, much sustenance to be surrounded uh, by persecutory figures. Uh, so in the delusion may lie a key to the code of the person's thinking. Sometimes, as our previous cases illustrate, it may take years to establish a durable enough self-object experience to be able to escort the patient into a more secure internal milieu. In this case, it was actually a little bit more simple. Um, I quickly saw that the opening lay in the rats gnawing at her, and a self-psychologically oriented analyst will want to understand this from an experience near perspective. Did they mean anything to her? Not surprisingly, no one had asked her what these three rats meant to her, which is kind of shocking, although maybe not in today's day and age. I used to think it was shocking each and every time I heard it, and then I kept hearing its sensations. Um, it's strange that a person can be totally immersed in a terrifying or otherwise upsetting series of thoughts or a delusion and also themselves not think about, why is, am I having this experience? Um, how can a patient or a psychiatrist make sense of uh, bizarre delusions if they never, never discuss the possible content, meaning, or emotion contained within? Um, as we've seen before, or we're going to be seeing here, without enough psychological oxygen provided by a self-object experience, the patient is left at the whim and fury of all sorts of terrifying perceptual experiences. So I pondered, and I, in my best Columbo fashion, scratching my head, I said, I wonder what the three rats mean. She didn't know. I had some sense immediately, for she had three children. When did the image begin? Lois noted that it was during the long six months at that time hospitalization after the birth of her youngest child, when she couldn't bear to see her children, felt terribly guilty about being away from them, yet she felt unable to be involved in any interaction with them. Could the number three, I asked, relate to her children? Her children burrowing into her as her own feelings of loss and guilt about not being involved with her children buried into her. She hadn't thought about this as a possibility. This not having thought about it as a, is a part of the difficulty in a delusional person. Such a person needs help to understand the meaning of his productions, the psychological mechanisms involved, and most of all, to deal with the underlying feelings that led to the formation of delusions. That it is why it is so essential that the treating psychiatrist or therapist attempt to clarify the ramifications of delusions and hallucinations. To not do so, to diagnose and medicate alone, often leaves a patient without a channel to understanding themselves. Yet explanations are not curative in and of themselves. As mentioned earlier, we view symptoms as breakdown products of a previously intact self. 
In order for strengthening and rebalancing to take hold, the patient must, must experience an empathic connection between themselves and the therapist. So I'll speak a little bit about the nature of delusion and self-psychology. Not all delusions are persecutory. In mania and depression, one can find delusional phenomena at work. Such delusions operate on a continuum from overvalued ideas to frank delusions and they exhibit a fluidity at times, but other times uh, delusions can be quite fixed, rigid, and unrelenting. Uh, let's listen back to Carl Jaspers here, the great, the great phenomenologist. We can distinguish two large groups of delusion according to their origin. One group emerges understandably from preceding affects, from shattering, mortifying, guilt-provoking, or other such experiences, from false perceptions, or from the experience of derealization in, in states of altered consciousness. The other group for us is psychologically irreducible. Phenomenologically, it is something final. We give the term delusion-like ideas to the first group, and the other group he called them delusions proper. In their case, we must now try and get closer to the facts of delusional experience itself. Jaspers go on, goes on to look at three distinct possibilities. The first step is an awareness of change in one's personality, much as one might feel if one had put on a uniform for the first time and it felt somewhat conspicuous. So uh, this is Jasper. Paranoiacs think that the change in themselves, which they alone appreciate, is also noticed by the environment. From this delusion that one has become noticeable arises the delusion that one is being watched, and from that the delusion is one of being persecuted. This is the second group. The same may be said for an attempt to derive delusion from preceding affects. The affect of distrust, for instance. We are only offered an understandable context for the emergence of certain stubborn misconceptions. And we find every degree of mental defect without delusions of any kind. And the most fantastic and incredible delusions in the case of people with superior intelligence. This is still Jasper's. The critical faculty is not obliterated but put into the service of the delusion. We have to assume, assume some specific alteration in psychic function. Delusion is a psychological product in psychic, uh, is a mental creation from the point of view of meaningful connections. It's motivated, it's dynamic content. Uh, deficit states that are, result, are a result of trauma or the combination of vulnerability and trauma can lead to severe disruptions in the structure of the self. Although there is a risk in reification, we can begin to think of what Jasper calls a primary delusion as something internally erected. It's a scaffolding, as it were, and we might define it as a self-state structure or a compensatory structure. So think back to Kohut's description, which is in the beginning of the book, um, uh, at the Chicago Institute, and he moves away from this issue of persecutory delusions in the Schreber case and unconscious homosexuality being the cause, to his image of a patient finding him or herself unstable, on precarious ground, think of Lois, um, desperately hanging on to the edge and that the delusion is some temporary scaffolding. Um, in the analysis of the self, there is this uh, uh, breakdown products, which I showed you a little bit earlier, the, and it's, it's reproduced in the book, um, about breakdown in the realm of the grandiose self and in the realm of the mirroring self. Um, uh, there are nuclei of the idealized uh, uh, omnipotent object, disjointed mystical religious feelings of vague awe, vague awe. These are descriptors that are involved in the experience of an insidious de-idealization. So if we have first mirroring and we have idealizing, there's a process of de-idealization which can be extremely unsettling and, re and requires some kinds of um, stop-gap measures, which the, uh, and so we, we actually are going to call this a delusionalization of the deficit. You'll see it in perversion, too, where there's a sexualization of a deficit. Um, 
Uh, myself and Les Havens pointed out that in paranoia and pathological narcissism, a breakdown in idealized experience, having the rug pulled out from under you leaves the patient in a self-state where there's an imminent threat of falling into a total collapse. Delusion then, as most uh, symptoms can be seen, serves as a self-state remedy or a delusionalization of the deficit that protects from implosion. Let's return to Lois. So we sat with that, Lois and I, for several weeks. Lois began to accept that, yeah, in fact, those three rats might represent her children gnawing at her. And during this period of time, I began to take a history of Lois and how she got to be this way. She was an only child of a critical and negative mother and a loving, indulgent father. Her father loved her unconditionally and served as a buffer against the constant jibes and denigrating comments of her mother. Her mother excoriated her, her father extolled her. When she was seven, she and her father were told by her intimidating, extremely impressive old Russian ballet teacher that she dances like she comes from another planet. Later, this comment by the ballet teacher evolved into a fantasy and then served as the seed of a delusion, a delusion from those early years of life that she had come from outer space. If she did come from outer space, this might account for her mother's criticism and caustic comments. She was sheltered in her father's love because he too must come from outer space. Her mother must be an earthling, jealous of her extraterrestrial origin. Such a belief comforted her and seemed innocuous. But unfortunately, it was laden with unforeseen difficulty. When she was 13, her father, extraterrestrial or not, died unexpectedly. In a normal idealizing channel, small digestible disruptions in the idealizing experience result in a strengthening of the self because you're going to have disappointments, but the question is, are they digestible? And are there people around who can help you with that? Um, this is what Kohut called transmuting internalization. Here children are able over time to internalize a self-esteem. Clearly her father loved her. The self-regulating functions which are previously provided by the ideal. Larger, deeper disappointments or losses can lead to a traumatic de-idealization resulting in developmental arrest. When your safety net is ripped away from you, some solution to the anxiety of falling off a cliff must be found. Lois was grief stricken and had to be hospitalized. She was hospitalized for a number of months. During these months, she did the expected. The expected for someone who has broken the bounds of reality. She created another delusion, this time of her father always with her. She had never talked about this belief to anyone before neither when hospitalized in her early teens nor during later hospitalizations or other periods of psychotherapy. She felt safe enough to tell me this, perhaps because she had been so frightened of the three rats which we had deciphered, perhaps because she felt we both could speak the same language, the language of understanding her delusional imagery. Since his death more than 20 years before, Lois had had her father constantly with her. When she'd go for a bike ride, her father would go for a bike ride too. When she'd have a cup of coffee, he too would have a cup of coffee. He was kept healthy and whole in her delusional reality. As far as Lois was concerned, her father remained vibrant and alive, not moldering and decaying in the ground. Long days and nights, when she was apparently alone, were spent immersed in conversation and delight with her lost and protected father. Lois kept her delusion a secret, probably because some part of her knew her father was dead and she didn't want to disrupt her internal world with the harsh world of a reality 
that included her continuously sniping a now depressed mother and the fact that her own real father had died. She appeared to the world to have recovered from the serious decompensation that had led to her adolescent hospitalization, but internally she maintained a vivid and rich delusional life through her ongoing activities with her believed in father. Externally, Lois appeared to keep it together, enough so that she married in her late teens. Yet internal preoccupations make choosing a stable spouse difficult. In her early 20s, she went further into her comforting delusions of her father when her first husband hanged himself for no apparent reason other than that he was doing drugs at the time. With the internal fabric of psyche ripped away from her again, this sudden unexpected and additional loss reinforced Lois's retreat into a delusional world with her father. Several years later, she married a very understanding, solid man who looked after her until she decompensated after the birth of her third child. The problem with delusion is compensatory structure. In the restoration of the self, 1977, Kohut elucidated how deficits in self-structure result in psychopathology, and he differentiated between compensatory structure, which provides a connection between the patient and either mirroring, idealizing, or twinship poles of the self, versus, def versus defensive or deficient compensatory structures. He said, quote, I call a structure defensive when its sole or predominant function is the covering over of the primary defect in the self. I call a structure compensatory when it compensates for the defect. Undergoing a development of its own, it brings about a functional rehabilitation of the self by making up for the weakness in one pole through the strengthening of another side. Most frequently, an area or a weakness in the area of exhibitionism and ambitions, which is mirroring, is compensated for by the self-esteem provided by the pursuit of ideals. So if there's a deficit in one, it can be made up for uh, on the other side. And the reverse can also occur. With respect to Lois, her quiet delusion expanded quickly after the death of an important man and then later with the birth of a child, which may have overextended the parent-child need she had already felt was so lacking. It comes as no surprise that she turned inward to the fantasized and delusional structure of her father with more commitment. Um, and with the continual tearing away at the earlier structure, Lois's preoccupation with her self-created relationship with her father served almost as like a vascular stent that allowed her to keep her emotional lifeblood flowing. A delusional reality is both fragile and rigid. Patients cling to delusions. Lois had had two very important losses which she attempted to deal with by creating the delusional reality of her comforting father always with her. Now with the breakdown after her third child in her 30s, she developed persecutory delusions that terrified her, in addition to the delusion of the rats gnawing away at her heart. Once delusional, one is always vulnerable to delusional crises and regressions until the delusions and the mechanism of delusion formation are explored, understood, and sustainable in a human way that connects to authentic sources of self-regard. This requires the establishment of an idealizing self-object transference, an experience that allows for reconstruction. Once one has fractured the bounds of reality, for whatever reason, one is prone to increasing delusion formation to offset potential new unbalanced threats to the self. What harm is there in the protective delusion of the father to help an adolescent cope with his death? The harm lies in the unrepaired rend in the fabric of her psyche, and thus increasing propensity to develop all types of delusions, running the gamut from protective to playful to destructive and terrorizing as a way of dealing with unbearable anxiety. In the process, one's actual self gets buried under a layer of self-obfuscating phenomena. Kohut discusses how a healthy self evolves. 
when one after the analytic penetration of the defensive structures and the exploration that Ira has um, explicated, the primary defect has been exposed and via working through, which he was doing, and a transmuting internalization gets sufficiently supported uh, by ongoing kinds of experiences. And we'll talk about that. One of the um, ways of thinking of therapeutic mechanism of change that one of Kohut's main colleagues, a fellow named Ernest Wolf, um, treating the self, I think it was 1987, he talks about the importance of disruption and repair, and disruption and repair. And they have to be tolerable disruptions, and they need to be repaired. But this then can serve as a much stronger um, bridge across the deficit. Uh, because it's alive, it's vibrant, it's self-repairing. And along with that, in a, uh, a solid self-psychological treatment, you will find that the patient will also do something that, that, um, that Wolf calls enlistment. And what is enlistment? Enlistment is to the extent that she finds safety and that she finds hope in meeting with Dr. Steinman and in the extent that they're working together to understanding. And there will be inevitable uh, ruptures in their relationship that will need to be repaired. But as, a, as an ongoing process, as things move along and the treatment gains traction, one needs to, you'll, you'll see an enlistment process where she's finding other places of safety, where she's finding other people who are sustaining. Um, other people who are inspirations. And that's part of what we call enlistment, which is, a, 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 I think, one of the main principles in self-psychology as part, part of the change process. Um, and now these uh, formerly defective structures of the self, the delusionalization, the sometimes sexualization, these, you know, filling is a part of what fills in what we call a vertical split. Um, they now become functionally reliable, this bridge. The patient has achieved cognitive and emotional mastery with respect to the defenses surrounding the primary defect with regard to compensatory structures and the relationship between them. Functionally reliable. Um, and it's through this and these vicissitudes that the healing sort of can take place and a much more durable kind of uh, I guess, psyche, if you will, can uh, find itself more cohered, more positively, emotionally uh, toned, and um, in addition, a narrative can take hold as well, which also internally serves, this is my story. This is how this all evolved. There's a temporal continuity that can take hold. In the telling of her delusions and history, and with a little prodding from me, Lois was able to accept her father's death, her mother's neglect and abusiveness, and the other pains of life. Lois established an ongoing and durable, idealizing self-object experience. She was able to give up her delusions in the following fashion. She recognized how the belief that she was an extraterrestrial was a way of seeming important and special, as she had seemed special to her father and to her ballet teacher. It was a way to protect her from her mother and give importance to her own existence. But this was an extremely dangerous and difficult time for Lois. She'd held on to her father for 20 years after his death and now she was without her father. So during this period of time, there were two or three very short hospitalizations, as I'd stayed as close to what was going on with her as possible, maybe two or three days at a time, occasional smidgens of antipsychotic medication, because during all of this time, I had been lowering the antipsychotics that she'd been on. But giving up this delusion was so hard for her, she'd never been able to mourn her father's death 20 years earlier. 
Here we see improvement of the primary defect with the mourning process of unbearable grief becoming bearable with my steadfast attention during the course of therapy. This relinquishing of the delusion of her father was aided by the development of a transitional short-term delusion of her three children constantly by her side. Now this was a fascinating creative development on her part. Suddenly she began to see her three children there with her. And she was certain that yet again I was going to tell her that this was a very bad idea to have a delusion of her children. But I said this was a great creative masterpiece on her part. What it meant was that she needed to make an attempt to contact her ex-husband and see if she could start to build up her, a life with her children. She was delighted. She contacted the ex-husband with great trepidation. And he was delighted to have her become involved with her own children again. We were able to talk about her yearning for those she loved, whether father or estranged children. She had used delusions to believe she was in contact, while all the while being powerless to contact people, those she loved. With this change of focus toward the world and an emphasis on the means of reconciling with her children, Lois was able to shift her attention from her delusional compensations and focused all of her energy on her children. Without internal delusions taking up her loving energy, her cathexis, she was able to reestablish a very good and ongoing relationship with her children. In addition, she became quite successful at two differing careers, neither of which was ballet. It was, again, I have to emphasize how disturbed Lois was. She was such a burnt out case that initially she started at the very bottom rung of a volunteer organization after she'd worked through this delusional material. And within about the space of eight or 10 months, she was the head of the volunteer organization because her vibrancy, her vitality, David always talks about the vitality affects, had returned and she was able to be an extremely engaging person in the world. Now, Lois stayed in, I saw Lois in the mid-70s, a long time ago. And she would stay in touch off and on. I saw her maybe for a year and a half, two years at the longest. I get letters every six months. This is way before email or text or anything. And probably by 1980, I'd lost touch with her. 30 years later, I'm on a radio show talking about treating the untreatable. And there's an email for me. The host gives it to me. Everybody's very reverential. Thank you, doctor. You saved my life, all that kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, now, who is this? And I remember it's actually Lois. And there was her contact information. So I contacted Lois afterwards. She had remarried. She had a wonderful time with her children. She was now a grandmother. She tolerated her second husband's death. She'd had two very prestigious and important jobs, which she'd done extremely well at, and she'd retired, and she was functioning in an artistic capacity at that point. No medication ever again. No delusions, according to her, but with creative people, you never really know. <laughs> All right, I think I will toss this open then for Questions of any kind? If not, I'm sure David has something erudite to say here. No, not really. <laughs> um, I, I just think it's uh, a good example of the vertical split and um, the difference between having a, a delusion or a delusional system that sort of bridges that gap, which is very rigid. And if you can, uh, the, it's really not that the, the therapist does something to create a self-object experience. It's really that you're staying much more attuned to what's going on, being responsive, and working towards understanding. And I'm very fond of the understanding being something that stands under, that it provides a certain kind of footing. Um, and You'll see in there when we do talk, and we borrow from Dan Stern about vitality affects, 
that it's one way of staying sort of in uh, session to session, you know, where you will be very much attuned to um, duration, rhythm, beat, and never really uh, primarily replicating the duration, rhythm, beat of what's going on, but sometimes using a slight variation. Um, those of you, are people here familiar with Stern's 1985, the uh, interpersonal world of the infant, Ra raise your hand. So quite a few people are. Um, he, it's been, it came out again, I think, as a second edition, I'm not sure. Does anybody know when that was, the second edition? But it's something really useful for people who are working with more disturbed patients, um, who are having psychotic experience in terms of the different types, the experiencing self in particular. And the role of cross-modal attunement is something we address in the book um, as kind of the toolbox assembles. Today, you've sort of heard about the reestablishment of what was an idealizing experience where she had a place of safety where she could start to feel the potential for a future where things were not so unusual and bizarre, um, all of which allowed her to establish an idealizing experience with Ira where they could uh, move forward and that, that that rigid structure that was keeping her from fragmenting much more, but at times could become you know, really quite debilitating, uh, where that could step by step be replaced by a much more vibrant experience that she was having with her analyst, and where um, through disruption and repair that was tolerable, because he was still there and he was available and responsive and, and paying attention. And I was alive and a real person and not some figment of her imagination. Right. So that really is a crucial point, the attunement with the therapist and how that relationship begins to undermine the delusional structure. Right. And I would say um, rather than undermining the delusional structure, it provides a living bridge um, and a, a, li a, a life filled and vital bridge where there was just basically an empty space to fall into. And obviously, you know, where she's having to create a delusion to keep her from completely becoming lost and uh, collapsing. Well, how does that work? I agree, a living bridge with a real person in her life, interested in her, trying to make sense of her she, delusions. And she can eventually let go of that delusion. Of, right. the, of the way the delusions had worked for her. And wasn't that wonderful, the way she came up with the three children in a delusional space for her? Mm -hmm. And wasn't that great that instead of trying to get rid of that delusion, I said, go for it. Mm -hmm. Because they were there in the world as a possibility. And she could, you know, if the old notion that Freud had of cathexis is so accurate in this situation. She had all this loving energy and she kept putting in into her delusional life and suddenly she could take it and transform that energy into relationships with her children again and into putting her energy into being in the world and becoming a very successful person right. in the world. And you see it in this enlistment. Once the treatment has taken hold, you see it in this enlistment process where she's actually able to find other uh, stable, uh, supportive, safe relationships, you know, with the, the surprise that the husband is actually very interested right. in her having a relationship with the kids at this point in time. In the volunteer organization, the volunteer she, she went in on the lowest of levels. She, she could barely do filing, and pretty soon she's running it. That, too, is a safe place for her. Right, and one where she's being recognized right. as valuable. She doesn't have to think of herself as an extraterrestrial. Right. Yeah? I have a very specific question. This sounds like wonderful work, and it really helps me to understand, you know, delusions in a different way. Like, I'm curious, did you see, this is for Dr. Stone, did you see her 
being able to grieve, like I'm curious about the actual expression of emotion in therapy, because it sounds like love, you know, she had this capacity to love from her dad and it was misdirected somehow and you were able to bring it back into the world through your therapeutic relationship and to, through these safe places and safe reconnecting, recontacting. And I'm just curious, did she actually, was it necessary to mourn or? I think it's a little difficult to hear you, but I think you're asking, was she able to grieve? Yeah, yeah, and as, as I said, it was very iffy, and I had to be in very close contact with her for several weeks, and even put her in the hospital two or three times for one or two days and give her a little medication. Um, at that point, she was not able to grieve appropriately. But then, of course, she did after that, and there was a great deal of grieving about all the losses that she had had. So again, it's a step-by-step -step process. You can't expect someone who's been delusional suddenly to be able to handle stuff like a totally together person, but gradually she did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a comment or a question, and it's in the same area in a way, but I was, uh First of all, thank you both of you for a very uh, excellent presentation, very inspiring, I have to say also. And I'm just uh, uh, stricken uh, about how your, um, your description of how this delusionalization of the deficit, as you described, that protects against uh, further fragmentation or inclusion of itself. I was just stricken, especially in your case, about how uh, it could also be seen not that that's, I don't think it's another perspective, but it, it's also, I think, involved in pathological mourning processes. Like these delusions could be seen as maybe pathological forms of mourning, and that's probably what you're asking about also. And it just reminds me of, uh, in terms of some sort of developmental arrest. Yeah, I'm just reminded of something written in, at least in Danish, by Lars Torvald and Rosenbaum, where they speculate and, and theorize about how in one perspective, the, the core deficit in, in schizophrenia and related psychiatric disorder could be a deficit in the ability to mourn. And when I read that recently from them, I was reminded of Kubrick's theory, and I think it's, it fits very well together in a way, I think. I, I think that's a very good point. I mean, we could easily say that uh, her delusion about her father always being with her was a form of pathological mourning of her father. Yeah. Yes. I mean, a narcissistic or a protection because of a narcissistic deficit that right. maybe make her unable to mourn along those lines. Any other questions? I'm just kind of, yeah. I'm just kind of struck with, um, I'm just putting this in, in a parallel, different language, richer language, of what you're presenting, and with what uh, Aaron Beck presented. Um, at the, the opening evening of clients who, with getting their actual, recognizing the need that was compensated for in the delusional system, and have, starting to get that actually met in real in reality, in shared reality with other people. The parallels are just kind of striking, even the languages and the, and the, 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 the theories. Um, explaining and furnishing um, the process, but concretely, there's this, she was able, with your support, with your help, to, because she could reinvest in, in shared reality and having these needs net, met, that she could let that go. Yeah, and as he says, there's disruptions in that process that need to be carefully attended to. Because, yeah. you know, when you're about to fall into a pit, it's pretty unnerving, yeah. to say the least. And so here, you know, the repair is making sure that she's safe. And that actually strengthens uh, the idealizing experience with, with Ira. And it allows for her to have a uh, better footing from which she can then start to go through this grieving process. In other words, you're asking the question, what are the requirements of a grieving process? What do you need to have in place?
in order to go through grieving and get to the other side. What does the other side look like? Which is another interesting question. You know, but frequently you'll think about it in terms of, one would think about it in terms of internalization, right? That I carry you with me in some fashion. Right? And it wasn't until there was enough of that and, you know, through a history with Ira that she was able to, you know, um, have internal sources of uh, self, um, self-regard or self-esteem um, so that she could then let go and keep it inside her, go through the grieving process. There's a lot that we're not covering today. Um, uh, I'm thrilled with the number of people who are here. Uh, I think that self-psychology has a lot to offer psychosis um, and, um, you know, thank you for coming.